Good morning, scholars. Today we're going to continue our way through Forest Homeric Greek, looking at lines 393 to 412 of Book 1 of the Iliad. And this is where Achilles continues his pleading to Thetis, his mom, to appeal to Zeus on his behalf. Alasu ton gel du sa de a hupelu sa o des mon oak hecaton ke ron kales sas es macron o lumpon hon briare on kale usete oi andres de tepantes ai gai hon hoga alte bi ein Wo pa tros amenon. Hos ra para crony on e cates de to. Cu de egai on. Ton kai hupe de san macares de oi. Ud et e de san. Ton nun men ne sasa pa es do. Kai labe gunon. I can post at the sen, epitro esen arek sai. Tu stekata prum nas tekai amp hala well sai akaius. De nomenus hina pantes, et bauron tai basileos. Noi decai atre ides, euru creon agamemnon. When a ten ho taris stone a kai on uden eti sen. Okay, so here again he's speaking to his mom and he's just telling her what he'd like her to do. But at this point he's reminding her that she does hold, you know, she did do Zeus a favor and he's recounting the favor that. Uh, he did her when the other gods thought they would overthrow him by binding him. So, Ala su ton el du sa de a hupelu sa o des mon. So, the tone, of course, is Zeus, and the a, the a is vocative. So, hupelu sa o, second person aorist middle, um, why did I say indicative? No, this... Oh, no, it is indicative. Um, you went. Or you loosened. Tone. You loosened him. Um, so, hupo lusomai. You loosened him. You released him from his bonds. And so, at the bottom of this, you see how this... It's a really strange form just to look at because the alpha and the Eo Omicron of Hupelu Sao is actually an open, that is, uncontracted form of the second person singular of the Aorist middle. So at the bottom you see the forms as they exist in Spice, um, the Attic forms, of course, that do the full contraction. Uh, elu Samen, Elu So with the Omega which has resulted from the contraction of Alpha and Omicron. But, like I say in Homer, he's going to leave it open. So that's why you have the Alpha Omicron in the ending, Hupe Lusa O. So this is a hard form to get your mind around, both the Attic form and the open form. And then the third singular, Elu Sato. And so, um, Hupe Lu Omai, to release from, it takes the genitive, which you can examine at 1392. And so, you loosened him from his bonds. So, desmos is any means of securing something, a bond, or, you know, his bindings. Um, and, of course, it's in the plural. So, alasu ton gel tu sa de a. Hupelusa o desmon. Oak 
Hekaton ke ron kalesas es makron olumpon. So ok is oka with all speed immediately. Hekaton ke ros is the hundred handed one. This refers to Briarius, who will be named in a moment. Kalesasa is your feminine participle first aorist from kaleo to call or summon summon so having summoned kalesas es macron olumpon macros kron of course is high tall lofty so this is a regular epithet of olympus high olympus so oak hekaton ke ron kalesas es macron olumpon Hon briare on kale usete oi Andres de te pantes ai gai on Hoga alte bi ein wo patros amenon. So here we have this interesting collocation of particles de te, and Deniston tells us that te. He speaks of te following other particles. He says, since ideas which are presented antithetically or disjunctively may simultaneously be presented as simply added to one another. Okay, so on the one hand, on the other hand, with the idea of addition included, the combinations mente, dete, ete, present no difficulty to those who derive all the meanings of te from the root idea of addition. But the great majority of passages in which te is coupled with another particle contain general propositions or describe habitual action. And there are strong reasons for believing that here too, as in the case of relatives, te generalizes the action. So here, this is very uh, well exemplified, this generalizing notion. Because if you say that the gods call him one thing and the humans call him another, um, then you are definitely talking about a generalized or habitual action. So this is just a good example of the way te can work. Okay. Hon briare on kaikelusete oi, Andres de te pantes ai gaion. Ho ga alte bi ein wupatros amenon. So alte in one's turn is how Kunlef wants it to be translated. And Leaf gives you this note. The father of Briarius was, according to legend, Poseidon, as Poseidon in union with the other gods was stronger than Zeus, so his son, again, was stronger than he. And, um, you know, I'm not going to try to unpack that. That's just what Leif uh, adds to the idea. Now, B.A.N., of course, uh, in, translates in physical strength with respect to physical strength, or force, um, and so reading Smythe 1600, to verbs denoting a state and to adjectives, an accusative may be added to denote a thing in respect to which the verb or adjective is limited. So A, the accusative usually expresses a local relationship or an instrumental one. The word restricted by the accusative usually denotes like or similar to, good, better, bad, worse, a physical or mental quality or an emotion. So this is the much celebrated accusative of respect. So he was amenon wupatros, greater than his father bien, with respect to uh, power or physical strength. Now, so Briarios, Briarios was one of the hundred-handed giants who, being summoned to heaven, deterred Juno, Neptune, and Minerva, 
that is to say um, uh, Hera, uh, <laughs> uh, Poseidon, and Athena from attempting to dethrone Jupiter. He is represented by the poets in conjunction with his brothers, Gyges and Cautus, as guarding the Titans in Tartarus, whom they had conquered. So, you know, this is stuff that you'd read about in uh, Hesiod's Theogony, these early wars and uh, combats between the Giants and the Titans and the Olympians, and, you know, it, it's quite complicated. So, again, returning to Caldwell's edition of the Theogony and his very helpful charts, you will remember that um, uh, Gaia is Earth, and she has three offspring, Uranus, Urea, and Pontus, that is sky, rain, and sea. And so it's of her marriage with her son Uranus, sea. From that uh, union come the 12 Titans, the three Kaiplopes, uh, and the three hundred-handed beings. So we see the hundred-handed beings are Cautus, Briarius, and Gyges, as mentioned in the passage I just read. And so Briarius is the one who um, Thetis called to back her up in helping Zeus uh, overcome the attempt to overthrow him by the other three gods. So like I say, all this stuff is really deep and you see here in book one that we're shifting away from the politics and personal uh, disputes and histories of human beings to those of the divine realm. Okay. So, who hon briare on calusete oi Andres tedepantes aigai on Hoga alte bein wu patros amenon. So Amenon, as I said, Amenos, Amonos is superior or better. And then you have the genitive, Wu Patros, his father, and Smythe 1402 and 1431 to explain this genitive, with verbs signifying to surpass or to be inferior to or to be greater than, the genitive denotes that with which anything is compared. So here he's Amenon, Wu Patros, then his father. And then 1431. Adjectives of the comparative degree or implying comparison take the genitive. The genitive denotes the standard or point of departure from which the comparison is made, i.e. he's compared with his father, and often expresses a condensed comp comparison when actions are compared. And you can look at these examples on your own. Hos ra para cronione cates de to cu de igaion. Now, so cates domai is to set down, to take one seat. And he took his seat, para plus the dative of place beside the son of Kronios, that is the son of Kronos, that is Zeus. Hos ra para crony on it, cates de to, ku de igai on. Now, this ku de igai on is a very important or very interesting expression, I should say. And so, this is a note from Kirk. Again, Kirk's wonderful, but very advanced. He gives you no help whatsoever with the Homeric, uh, you know, the syntax and the grammar. He expects you to have mastered it. This is just a very, very high level commentary for graduate students or advanced undergraduates or professors. Um, but anyways, so Kirk says, Gaio is a form of ga nu me, meaning I am radiant with joy. Kudos also is a kind of emanation of power, confidence, and renown. So, Katezdeto occurs 11 times 
in the Iliad and three times in the Odyssey. And it is always in this position before the bucolic Kaisura, Kudei Gaion, long, short, short, long, long, Kudei Gaion. Um, and this Kudei Gaion occurs four times in the Iliad. Now, Kudei Gaion is always preceded by Katezdato, and it was devised probably in the first instance for Zeus. It occurs two times referring to Zeus, but is then subsequently applied to lesser beings. And so at Book 5, line 906, you find Ares represented as setting beside Zeus and basking almost comically in his aura. So this Kudei Gaion is a very, um, well, it's a, it's a singular and important expression in uh, Homer. So ton kai hupe de san makares de oi ud et de san. So hupe de san is an important word to, I mean, you might look at it and think it, it belonged or was ref, or was uh, related to deo to bind, but no, this is has the stem delta iota, and it means to fear and stand to stand in awe of, and so we see the entry from Smythe's index of verbs, where the delta iota. Um, Fear, and so you have edesa, dedoika, which is a perfect which serves as a present, and then a second perfect, dedia, which serves as a present as well. And then you have these epic forms, dedo, desomai, edesa, dedoka, dedoika, dedia. Homer also has a dion, feared, fled from an assumed present dio. So this is a good example where you have a word where these Homeric forms uh, could trip you up if you're not aware. So it's good to, you know, bask in uh, Smythe's index of verbs. So makar, makaros is an epithet of the gods. As an epithet of the gods means happy, blessed, living, and ease. So Ton kai hupe de san makares de oi, ud et e de san. So, of course, the ton refers to Briarius, and the makares de oi, they hupe de san. They were in awe. Ud et e de san. So, ud et e de san. This was just an opportunity for me to. Uh, give you guys a quick glance into the window of textual criticism because you have uh, this treated different ways in uh, by the editors. So I write here, Leaf, Monroe, and Deniston all suspect this appearance of Te. <coughs> they believe this appearance to fall among cases where, quote, Te is clearly insulted, inserted to avoid a supposed hiatus by a scribe who was ignorant of the digamma. Okay, that's quoting Deniston, page 530-531. For which reason, te could tenably be replaced by the personal pronoun we. So, you could have here ud Ud, ud, we, ud, we, ed, a, san, um, where you would be expressing the accusative object of ed, a, san, and they did not bind him, we. Now, on the other hand, you have the reading that I've represented where Martin West, however, following Allen's reading of the earliest 20th century, uh, Allen and Monroe's, uh, the uh, Oxford 
classical text. They read Ud et edesan, which translates, and no longer did they bind, and you have to supply or not, the hymn. So this is just a quick glance into the idea or the problems that, you know, the, the editors of Homer uh, face when you have these textual variants and alternative possibilities of construing what the tradition has handed down. Okay, so ton nun men ne sa sa pares deo kalabe gunon. So ton ne sa sa, the tone of course is demonstrative here, so reminding him of these things. Okay, so to remind someone, men, I equals Zeus, of something, the tone. Um, ton nun men ne sa sa pa es deo. This is the middle imperative, which in Attic would be contracted from pa es domai to take one seat beside. So taking one seat, take one, take your seat beside him and labe gunon. Labe is the active imperative second aorist of Lambano, <coughs> now, um, which means to grasp, to grab. Now, um, the imperative forms, I have to admit, the imperative forms, I think, are some of the hardest, well, they were some of the hardest for me to finally consolidate. So I have this little note where I say that Smythe 466 gives the ending of the imperative in an overview, but I consider the best way to review the forms of the imperative tense, tense by tense, is to start at page 114 of Smythe and to locate the forms near the bottom of the page and to watch on the subsequent pages as he progresses through the tenses of the various types of verbs, that is, the tenses of the imperative. So if you start at page 114 and look at the bottom of the page, you'll see that just the way the pages are laid out. The imperatives are all at the bottom of the page and you can just go through them and review them that way. But, um, you know, it takes some work to get to get really squared with these imperative forms. Um, Labe, in fact, has a little strange thing about the accent and you can refer to Smythe 424B for that. So, Labe Gunon, uh, Ganu is Ni, and uh, again, it's one of those verbs, nouns, that is legitimately irregular. And so you have to check out that list in Smythe. But gunon, of course, is genitive plural, so grab him by the knees and, and uh, you know, make your request. I can post at tele sen epitro esen arexai. So, a can pos et ele sen. The pos is in clitic and somehow, happily, perhaps. And this whole construction uh, gets elucidated at Smythe 2354, where a and aeon have a sense of on the chance that. So, we, so he says a or aeon may set forth the motive for an action or feeling expressed by the apodosis, and with the force of, on the chance that, in case that, in the hope that, if haply. And then, after primary tenses, in the apodosis, we have a with the indicative, or aeon, pulse, with the subjunctive. After secondary tenses, we have a with the optative, or occasionally aeon, pulse, with the subjunctive. Homer has sometimes the optative after primary tenses. The reference is to the future as in final clauses. So here, atelese is a present subjunctive form, and you can see Smythe's placement of it at 463C, bottom of the page. And atelo, of course, is to be willing. So, a can pos, et ele sen, epitro, es sen, 
RxI. And RxI is a first aorist active infinitive. And um, you see Arego to aid, to help, to succor. And um, you notice that the accent has a circumflex on the second from the last uh, syllable. And this gets treated in this note, well, both at uh, 425 of Smythe, where he tells you that this infinitive is one of those which defies the general rule for verbs of a recessive accent. And in the aorist active infinitive, you get instead the accent on the P note, the second from the last syllable. And so you come to the problem or issue of the alpha iota and how the length of that varies so that at 427 this is addressed final alpha iota or omicron iota, iota are regarded as long in the optative but elsewhere as short so that means here this not being an optative this alpha iota is short so hence we have to distinguish these f forms of the first aorist and so you see that in the middle one, the infinitive active, um, you always, in every case, have the circumflex right before or second from the last syllable. And um, again, because of uh, what we find at 425, that the infinitive of the first aorist accents on the second from the last syllable, because the alpha iota is short, you can actually have the circumflex. So, lu psi, apa lu psi, pi dao psi. So, rx psi. So, here we're going to the deep bowels of accentuation and such. But I can post at the sen epitro sen rx psi. Tus te kata prum nas te kai ap hala wesai akaius. So the prumne is the stern of the ship, that is the hindmost or inmost or root of something, the prumnos. And um, so the, the end of the ships would be drawn up on the shores. They would be, you know, they would be pointed toward the shore so, so the ships could just be dragged into the water the way they wanted to go. So this is where Achilles is describing that he wants the Trojans, or he wants Zeus to, en to enable the Trojans to push the Greeks all the way back across the plain to their ships and to the sea. Okay, and so we have this wonderful verb, well sigh, from halo, which means to roll up, to drive together, but and hence to hem in, to pin in, to coop up. So we imagine soldiers, you know, who are pinned down, you know, in a defensive position. This is what uh, Achilles imagines and wants to happen to the Greeks, that they are pinned down, you know, at their ships, at the sterns of their ships and along the sea. So tus kata tus de kata prum nas tekai ap hala well sai akai us tenomenus. So this is wonderful the way you have the um enjambment, that is the carrying over of the meaning of the verse to the next line. And te no manus, of course, passive parsable from teno to kill and passive getting themselves killed, i.e. being murdered, being slaughtered. This is what he hopes is going to be happening to the Greeks, um, you know, along the shore at their ships. Hina pantes epauron tai basile os. Let me just read this little note. In Attic prose, apotnesko is generally used as the passive of apokteno. Um, why did I even include that. Well, let's just not confuse things uh, because you will rarely, if ever, see the simple form in Attic. 
but Homer gets away with just using Taino by itself. So, te nomenus hinapantes apaurontai basile os. So, apaurontai is aorist subjunctive from eparisco, which means to touch, to have benefit from, or ironically, as Kunlif renders it, to have cause to bless him. Hina, of course, is a purpose. Hina, so that Pontes, all the Greeks, eparontai basileos, so all the Greeks, the Greeks enjoy their king. <laughs> So the genitive is used with verbs signifying to touch, to take hold of, to make trial of, to have a taste of. So this is a very, um, a very uh, colorful expression. Eparontai basileos. Okay. No dekai atre ides eru creon agamemnon when aten. So, noi, of course, is your third singular second aorist subjunctive of ignosco, to know or recognize, and this continues the purpose clause, and also, decai, and also, so that um, the son of Etrius, wide ruling Agamemnon, will know, or may know, okay? And what's he going to know? He's going to know Wayne Aten, his own madness. So Ate, Ate is a very, very important uh, word in Greek mythology. And it refers as uh, Kunlif describes it, quote, the blindness of mind sent by the gods, a divine perversion or deception of mind leading to evil doing or mischief, okay? Um, or as Slip used, Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. Um, okay. So, wain aten hotariston akayon uden eti sen. So, hote, hote, somebody translates that, and reading Smythe 2578, the conjunctions introducing dependent statement are hot. Homer also has hote, ha, and hote. Um, hos, dioti, hopos, huneka, hotuneka, which are last two being poetic. And then a, hote meaning that was originally like Homeric ha, perhaps an accusative of the inner object. Um, horo, ho, no says. Literally, I see what sickness you are sick with. Okay, hein no son no says. But by the time of Homer, both ho and hote had become mere formal conjunctions. Homeric hote, that, seems to be a weakened hote when, but this is disputed. So we can compare the earlier time we've seen this uh, in line 245. Ko omenos hotaris ton akai on uden etisas. And so we have the same verb going on here. Um, hot ariston akai on uden etisan. So that or even because, but more likely that. Um, you know, knowing his madness, the fact that he did not at all honor the best of the Achaeans. Okay, so al suton gel tu a hupelu sao desmon oak hecatoke ron kalesas es macron o lumpon hon priare on kale usete oi. Andres de Tepantes I Gaion, Hoga Ate B N Wupatros Amenon, Hos Rapara Cro Ni One Cates de To Cude I Gaion, Ton Kai Hupe de San Macares de Oi, 
ud at æde san. Tån nun men ne sa sa pa es do kai labe gu non. I can post at dele sen epitro esenarek sai. Tus de kata prum nas te kai apala wel sai a kai us. De nomen nos, hina pantes, e paron tai basile os, noi de kai ater ides, e ru creon agamemnon, wen a ten hotariston a kai on uden etisen. Okay, so there we have it, and we end here with a wonderful, this is from, uh, the British Museum, I believe, and it's a picture of the scene that we are talking about. You see the hundred-handed one, or, or you see uh, helping Zeus be uh, in his defense against these gods who are attacking him, although this figure is a lot more complex than that. Um, one would have to look at it, look it up and, and uh, to unravel all the iconography here, but nevertheless, a wonderful picture. Okay. So continue to work hard, and I'll see you again soon to, uh, as we advance through and to the end of Book 1 of the Iliad. Have a good day. Bye-bye.